Good morning. This is Anthony Nyagan. Today it's a little unusual topic, I think. It is about religion as an experience realized. Let's take a look at a specific reading in John chapter 4. It is about that Samaritan woman in a place in Samaria where the Jacob's well was. Jesus was waiting there and the word says Jesus tired out by his journey was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For a certain reason, there is another set of words included, which is verse 8, but this is in brackets or rather parentheses. It says, his disciples had gone to the city to buy food. Then it continues. The Samaritan woman said to Jesus, How is that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Then again, the parentheses and the brackets come in. It says, Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Then the story continues. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Then she continues, Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob? who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming back here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you are right in saying, yeah, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Listen to these words again. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and the truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship Him. God is spirit and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. Again, who 
who is called Christ is in parentheses or brackets. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman. But no one said, what do you want? Or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. That's the reading. There are conflicts in this reading, if you have noticed. First of all, Jesus was all by himself in the middle of the afternoon. No one remained with him. All of them went to the nearby towns to run errands. Jesus was with the Samaritan woman by himself. This conversation was private between the Samaritan woman and Jesus. This reading does not lend itself to historical interpretations. Yet, historical, chronological and cultural interpretations are plenty around. How could St. John write this chronological detail about something he did not even witness? Well, the conflict goes on. Most likely, St. John did not write this. His disciples wrote the Gospel. Most likely, his disciples wrote down what St. John spoke during his satsangs. Satsang, by the way, is a spiritual discourse between a master and his followers. Then again, what are the basis for this chronological sequence of words? Where did the words come from? Jesus asked for water. Why it, did he not drink that water? It was in the middle of the afternoon and he was under the scorching sun. He was thirsty. But there were only discussions about water. There were no drinking. Why? Instead, Jesus wanted to give her water. Why he did not give? Why did the woman leave the water jar behind and went back to her people? See, likewise, there are many questions to be asked about these words. Now, questioning the word in the Gospel, is it wrong? Is inquiry wrong? Is seeking for answers wrong? No. No. Actually, this is where we communion with the Holy Spirit for clarity and answers. That is why this is not the only situation in the Bible. There are so many in the Bible, in the Gospel especially, that are based literally on hearsays. Is it okay to ask questions about it? Yes, it is. And it is perfectly okay to ask questions. It's perfectly okay to go to the Holy Spirit and ask Him what is going on here. See, the detail in such situations is really meant to be inspired by the Holy Spirit. Now, when you are with the Holy Spirit in supplications and prayer, spark of inspirations of wisdom only come to us when our mind is empty of human knowledge. See, when Jesus is talking about the Beatitudes, the first word he says is, Blessed are the poor in spirit. 
In these words, poor means having nothing in your spirit. See, in other words, what it says is we cannot go to the Holy Spirit, you know, with full of knowledge, loaded with knowledge, and ask him for clarity. That's that's not the way it is. We need to go to him when we are totally empty of our own versions of the truth. See, when the inspiration is first received, it does not have clarity, but loaded with divine emotions such as tremendous peace, joy, love, delightfulness, a feeling of gratefulness. See, these divine emotions do not disappear quickly. They linger on. When we delight in the lingering emotions over the days, that is when clarity comes in. This is how wisdom communicates to us. I'll give you an example. See, when we learned the first language, the language did not come to us in one day. It came to us very slowly. Therefore, the spark and clarity may have come to St. John the Apostle, who disclosed them to the disciple. But the more important realization is, inspirations do not have a finite end. It continues even over generations. In other words, if we seek more clarity of this particular incidence in the, in the gospel from the Holy Spirit, he will reveal to us more and more mysteries about the eternal spring of water that gushes all the way up to heaven. He will reveal to us more. So what we read in the gospel is not the end of the revelations. There is more to it. See, seeking wisdom to reveal to us the mysteries so that we would grow in the knowledge and knowing about Jesus, that is where spirituality begins. Only because in the growing knowledge about our beloved, love thrives. In this case, our beloved is Jesus. So we need to have knowledge that is always on the increase for our love to Jesus to thrive. There is nothing wrong about going beyond the intellectual knowledge about Jesus and seeking the knowing of the wisdom to learn more about Jesus from the Holy Spirit. But the traditional Catholic Church makes the blunder of associating, seeking the knowledge to learn more about Jesus from the Holy Spirit and spirituality to mysticism. Now, mysticism has negative associations not only in Christianity, but even in other religions. See, several spiritual entertainers over the years leverage and package mysticism and such negative association to lure seekers with clever answers, quick fixes, and ritual practices that could easily demoralize the seekers and lead them in the wrong direction. People have been doing that over the years for material gain. And the Bible is totally against such mysticism. But Christianity and the ritual practices in spirituality are for us to progress in the real experience of Jesus in our lives, guided by the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. 
in Christian spirituality, Christ experience comes from Christ and the wisdom comes from the Holy Spirit. See, they do not come from me. All I do is point you in a direction best suited for you and suggest certain prayer rituals that would help you get started and progress quickly in your own journey. See, the mystical theology and especially Catholic faith, the, the Christian faith other than the Catholics, they disregard mysticism totally. So let's talk about the Catholic faith and mystical theology. The mystical theology as defined in the Catholic Church is the unique path. They could be okay for people in religious life such as the Catholic priests, the nuns and the monks, etc. From the beginning of Christianity, the Church has produced remarkable saints in the Church who were mystics. But mystical theology as defined by the Catholic Church must to be practiced under close supervision and guidance. That is why it thrives in religious communities such as the Carmelites, Capuchins, the Jesuits, etc. But it is not at all practiced for the seculars. In other words, mysticism is not actively recommended for the practice of secular Catholics. That is why we haven't had a secular mystics in the history of the church. See, the mysticism and the other denominations, the other denominations are totally against the mysticism from their inception as religious orders. They believe people who join the church, the body of people, not a building or denomination, accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and master. To them, leave the church, that means the body, means to deny Christ. This is an unforgivable sin. There is no way back from this. Jesus does not accept the apostate into the kingdom. This is how they interpret Matthew 12, 31 and 32. A genuine believer can never become an unbeliever because they have been born again by the Spirit of God. You cannot experience the unseen for that is what faith is. It is the power of God inside you that enables continual faith, meaning Christ's experience is totally absent, except faith in something that is totally unknown, even after our death, exists in this theology. See, this is the limitation of understanding when we explore the mind of God by means of human intellect and understanding. See, in Matthew 16.23, let me see if I can find it. Matthew 16.23 says, he, be, he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. For you are setting your mind not on the divine things, but human things. See, these are words spoken by Jesus. But it had been through so many translations, so many interpreted, interpreted versions of it. But I have read in Aramaic versions that, that it says, you are not thinking like God, but you are thinking like human beings. 
So in other words, according to Jesus, we are supposed to think like God. But our human intelligence always interferes with our thought process, processes. in the wisdom of God. Wisdom is revealed to us when our mind is free of intellectual clutters. That is why Jesus says in the Beatitudes, the first sentence in the Beatitude, he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Poor in spirit means absolutely having nothingness in our mind, our mind being free of intellectual clutters. It is for those who are free of intellectual clutters, the kingdom is revealed to them. That is the first sentence in the Beatitudes of Jesus. See, when we go to the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, I know everything, now teach me your wisdom. That is not the way to learn from the source of all knowing. In fact, we will get nowhere. There is clarity and difference we find between the religion and spirituality in the experience. See, religion is an experience realized. Religion is a philosophical way of living in an intellectual belief system of mind, whereas spirituality is an experience realized. See, I do not disagree with the intellectual interpretations of Matthew 12, 31, 32, but it makes me question the mercy of God. Therefore, I do not stop at questioning. I pray to the Holy Spirit and seek the mysteries to find an answer. Practically speaking, denial of the Holy Spirit is the denial of wisdom. Wisdom is the source of all knowing and divine experiences. How can anyone deny wisdom and still be able to enjoy the fullness of life? To me, these words of Matthew 12, 31 and 32 manifest the immensity and purpose of the love of Christ, especially to those who deny the mysteries of God's wisdom. Religion is, of course, a philosophical way of living, but it is also an experience realized. From a religious point of view, we know about the love and mercy of God from the words that we read. To me, I have experienced the scope of God's love and mercy. I have gone beyond the philosophical way of living to the real experience of God. Brothers and sisters, I am a sinner. I'm not a holy man. Yet, Jesus called me to serve him. I also left the church in my early 20s and went astray. I followed many Eastern religions since I believed that they taught me better ways to have an experience of Jesus instead of the knowledge of Jesus. I was right about that. They did teach me ways and means to experience God in my life. In my late 50s, the church did nothing to bring me back. 
but Jesus did. He not only brought me back, but made it a point to reveal to me that there are plenty of mysteries in the Bible that also teaches me how to have a life in Christ instead of the knowledge of Christ. Well, it took over 10 years for the Holy Spirit to teach me these mysteries. See, what I offer to the lost sheep is the same hope Jesus gave me. To imagine that God is going to look the other way when it comes to over one billion lost sheep is intellectual naivety. God loves all his children, including all his prodigal children. In fact, it is the return of the prodigal son our father celebrates, not for the ones who remains faithful to him.